So like anything worth doing, cyber threat intelligence requires a life cycle, a beginning, middle, and end. And it's not an end that just ceases, it's an end that starts a new beginning. We have to iterate over these processes to incrementally improve how we operate, how we collect, how we analyze, and how we disseminate information is critical to the threat intelligence life cycle. And this again goes back to the problem that many organizations think that they can just buy threat intelligence feeds and plug this information in somewhere. And it just, you know, happens that, you know, magic just occurs and now they're protected against these threats. Threat intelligence requires people. It requires analysis, it requires communication, it requires understanding. And if we don't have those things, we simply do not have a threat intelligence team or a process in our organization. So there's six general processes to creating and managing cyber threat intelligence. The first is being requirements. The goal of the requirement phase of cyber threat intelligence is to essentially understand what we don't understand, a knowledge gap assessment. We can see this in our network and we cannot see this. We don't know who wants to attack our network and we don't know why they want to attack our network. We don't know what's valuable in our network as it relates to adversaries. And all of those questions drive requirements. We now know we need to identify what type of threat actors would be more likely to attack our organization. We need to understand the TTPs and risks to our assets, and in doing so, understand what will be of value in our organization once we identify those adversaries. Maybe we've done a terrible job of assessing internal risk, our critical assets. But if we understand adversaries and what they're trying to go after, that can help us in identifying what sources of information in our network are valuable to an adversary. And this is like saying, Oh, yeah, that customer database we have that we didn't really think was that important. Wow, apparently it's really important to these five threat adversaries. They really want this kind of information. And we never thought to ourselves that was something that was important. But hey, because you have it, you are now a target to those five organizations. So whether you feel it's valuable or not, you are now on the target list because you have that type of data. So it's important to build out these requirements and these knowledge gap assessments so that we could begin to answer some of them. And we begin answering some of them by looking at what we do for collection. What methods and sources do we use to acquire information? And that could be information from our internal sources, our current logs, post uh, incident breach reports that we've had inside of our network. This can include open source information. We can also purchase vendor or free open source community feeds. Why not all of the data? Data is relatively cheap to store nowadays, consume everything, buy everything that you can get away with, and then do the correlation and analysis to make sense of that information. And that pivots us into processing. Before we can analyze information, we have to deal with the problem that all data is not the same format. Many vendors may provide their data in the form of PDF. Some might give Word documents. We might have internal CSVs or Excel spreadsheets. We might have binary pieces of malware or binary log types like event logs. So we have all of this data. It's in these different formats and we've got to contend with that. So we need a method to process this information and store this information to be accessible. And this is the same process and problem we had to deal with when it came to acquiring a SIM. We have network logs, we have endpoint logs, we have all these different kind of logging formats, cloud and everything going on. And we needed a single point to collate and process this information to make it where we can analyze it. And there's no difference here for cyber threat intelligence. And there's many platforms that allow us to do that. So long story short here is we need a solution to correlate this information and process this information so that we can do analysis. And that, of course, leads us to the analysis phase. And the goal here of analysis is assessing the confidence and quality of the information we've collected through collection and processing. What is the correlation of indicators and events? I have timestamps, I have IP addresses, hashes, domain names, TTPs, attack MITRE IDs. I have all these different metrics and different indicators and topics. And we need a solution that can start correlating the relationships. Oh, I've seen this IP address in this other report, or I've seen this IP address in this other piece of log data. Being able to correlate all this information together is critical to build a report so that we can analyze it to create our own intelligence for dissemination. The dissemination process is essentially a practice in understanding who our readers are and how they consume our information. 
we do not want to send very deep technical information to executives. We want to send them strategic information. So once we've collected, processed, and analyzed information within our organization, whether that was prior full cyber threat intel reports or it was raw technical data that we had to consume and analyze, we then have to disseminate this information accordingly, strategic to executives, operational information to the security ops leads, CISO, and other people who are worried about the day-to-day -day operations, the tactical information to the analysts supporting the detection and analysis of the techniques and tools and sophistication and capabilities employed in a network. And then last but not least, that technical information. We have somebody managing the intrusion prevention system. They just need a blacklist of known bad IPs and domains, and they're going to put it on block for us. So regardless of how we collect, process, and analyze data, we need to understand that information has to be funneled to the appropriate audience in the appropriate format with the right level of detail so that they can either make a decision or take action appropriately. Strategic intelligence, while great to a frontline defensive analyst, that is great because it will you know, help them understand what's going on, but at the end of the day, does not help them do their job any better. They're not able to take a strategic trend report and turn that into detection or defense mechanisms that we can use to protect our network. Last but not least, the most important process here is feedback. Getting feedback on how this information is supporting the organization and its impact to defending or allowing organizational members or stakeholders to make decisions is key in determining if this CTI process works. And remember, this is a process that does not end. Feedback needs to go back into the requirements. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase, doing good work just makes more work. And really that's what happens here. If we're doing a good job in our CTI and we're providing information so decision makers can make decisions, we're providing information that analysts and operational leads can protect and defend the network. All that does is illuminate them to more of what they don't know. The more we learn, the more we learn how much we don't know. And the more we know how much we don't know, the more requirements we will receive. So cyber threat intelligence is a never ending process of improving what we know upon right now so that we can learn about something we did not know tomorrow. And the things we don't know in the future that we now know, that's a little confusing, become new requirements. And we continually operate on that process to drive new requirements, new collection, processing new data formats, conducting new and unique types of analyses so that we can disseminate that information to understand where we need to go next. And that's a very important aspect of this overall life cycle is getting good feedback and bringing that back into the requirement phase and iterating and improving on that process. So let's pivot really quickly. We've talked about the cyber threat intelligence life cycle and what generally cyber threat intelligence is, but let's look at where we're going to need most of our knowledge and what's going to help us in our tactical and operational capabilities here in the near term. And one of the biggest tools that we have at our disposal for both learning and preparation for these attacks is the MITRE attack framework. MITRE is a not-for-profit organization that has done a ton of research in both industry and government, and they have a core focus on cybersecurity and they're one of the driving forces behind CVE or the common vulnerability enumeration formats. Pretty much any vulnerability by any vulnerability scanner that exists uses CVEs as a standardized framework for recording vulnerabilities. So MITRE is at the forefront of a lot of technologies and capabilities used today. But one of the things we're going to be talking about that's more specific to this discussion in threat intelligence is the attack framework or the adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge tool. So the attack framework is a matrix that allows us to look at all the known TTPs as it relates to what's been observed in a matrix style format. We can look by category and technique. And we're able to drill down into these categories and techniques to learn how these techniques are done. How does an adversary use this to satisfy their objectives? And in doing so, we're learning about these TTPs. We're learning how to detect the use of these TTPs. And in many cases, how to prevent them from occurring to begin with. So if you navigate to attack.mitre.org and you scroll down just a little bit, you're going to find yourself looking at this. This is the Enterprise MITRE ATT&CK Framework or matrix. We have the various tactics along the top, such as initial access, execution, persistence, privilege escalation, defense, and so on. So these are the tactics that will be used by adversaries to compromise networks, steal information, and get that information out of the network. 
Within these various tactics columns, we have techniques. These are the very specific methods that will be employed by an adversary to satisfy that tactic. An example would be, if I need to do lateral movement as an adversary, I have nine techniques that I can use in my employ. I can use exploitation of remote services. And we can drill down into exploitation of remote services to learn more about how adversaries conduct the lateral movement technique or how adversaries conduct lateral movement tactics using exploitation of remote service techniques. So let's take a look at that really quickly and how we would generally use the attack murder framework. So looking at the lateral movement tactics column in this example on the far left, we can see that we're interested in remote service session hijacking. So an adversary would do lateral movement through remote service session hijacking. That's how we would categorize and quantify what an adversary is doing on our network. And by selecting this gray bar to the right, we have sub techniques. There's multiple techniques or sub techniques that relate to the parent technique. There's more than one way to do remote service session hijacking. So clicking on that, we can see that there's SSH hijacking and RDP hijacking. And selecting the RDP hijacking technique, we find ourselves at the appropriate overview page that talks about what remote service session hijacking is, and more specifically, RDP hijacking. What's benefit about the, the Attack Miter framework here is that it provides us an overview of what RDP hijacking is. It's an educational tool. It then goes into giving us references to actual use by adversaries. So it provides us threat intelligence sources, a report from Mandiant or a report from FireEye that states this is what occurred. This is how remote session hijacking through the use of RDP was conducted in this investigation, how this adversary did it or this named adversary group uses it. We can then review that report and get information on the detection or remediation mechanisms if they exist. And in this case, we can see that there was a method to detect RDP hijacking. So at a high level, we can look at the various tactics adversaries would use to compromise a network. We could then drill down to the other available techniques that an adversary can use, and we would ultimately find ourselves on the page that provides us insight, awareness, and means to detect that activity in our network. So this is a end-to-end -end solution that provides us a lot of awareness and visibility on known techniques and tactics used by adversaries. It's not all the TTPs of all adversaries, but it is a really, really good place to find a lot of information about a lot of different adversaries. And there's a lot more we can do with the Attack Miter framework. There's an enterprise discovery tool, which you'll be using in one of our labs, to filter out these TTPs as it relates to a known adversary. So you'll be able to take a known adversary that you think may compromise your network, and you can actually have the tool highlight and show you every tactic and technique that adversary is known to use. So very, very quickly, you can answer questions like, if APT pick a number, let's say APT1, is going to attack us, we now know of every tactic and technique they may use. And that's empowering to know that because we can now go down to the operational, technical, and technical levels to say, what do we need to do to defend ourselves against these tactics and techniques? And that's the power of what the MITRE ATT&CK framework provides. So in summary, cyber threat intelligence is information that supports decision makers and others in their ability to do their job more effectively. It helps us align our risk and posture to known threats that wanna take advantage of our networks, our business, our way of operating. So if we can identify those adversaries, we can prevent the damage or the likelihood of the adversary being successful in gaining access to our network. Remember that cyber threat intelligence is comprised of six phases of effort from requirements, collection, processing, analysis, dissemination, and feedback. Requirements and feedback are the building blocks for a solid cyber threat intelligence process. If we're not defining good solid requirements, we're gonna be all over the place, we're gonna have scope creep, and we're never gonna get any information of real value that can be used to support decision makers. The feedback we receive from that process should go directly into improving the process starting with requirements. How do we improve our processes and get better information or identify new requirements that need to be satisfied based on previous information we've provided. I wanted to note that an organization needs to be mature to incorporate cyber threat intelligence. Like we've talked about quite a bit, we can't just 
pour cyber threat intelligence on the top of our security program like magic dust and hope that it solves our problems. It's information that needs to be analyzed, assessed. We need to correlate it with our goals and objectives and empower our organization to defend itself against these known adversaries and their TTPs. Remember, there's four types of threat intelligence that gets disseminated. Strategic intelligence for executive level decision makers, operational for operational security teams, CISOs, SOC managers, and those interested in how adversaries operate and what their sophistications and capabilities are. Tactical information, such as what techniques and procedures do they employ? So we could think of the attack miter matrix, the framework, as being a tactical information or intelligence platform that helps us understand the TTPs of known adversaries. And then last but not least, that technical information, those blacklists, IPs, domains, hashes, things we want to quickly block in our network. But remember, technical information has a short shelf life. It's very easy for an adversary to pick a new IP, pick a new domain, and change the hash value of a binary. And the Attack Miter framework is a tool and wiki that allows us to discover known adversary TTPs and the associated methods for detection, and it includes reference sources that allow us to read about how adversaries use these TTPs. It's not just a listing of this tactic and these techniques. It has links to other sourced threat intelligence reports and how those tactics and techniques were used to compromise a network. So we can go from little to no knowledge of TTPs and adversaries to gaining a lot of knowledge and insight in how they operate by using the TechMiter framework. It's a very empowering framework that you should get very comfortable with using and reviewing a lot of the techniques.